The following interview was conducted with Charles F. Babs, Associate Research Scholar for the Department of Bas Basic Medical Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, February the 20th, 2009, in the television studio B26. Interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you. And um, let's talk a little bit about your parents in early years and a little bit about your schooling, high school. I was born and raised in Toledo, Ohio and went to high school, to Ottawa Hills High School, at, which was a public school system there. Okay. Um, went to Yale College. Major. Tell us a little bit about high school, what the activities and athletics or anything like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, let me see. High school, I was the third most unpopular person in my class. Okay. It wasn't cool to be a nerd in those days. And so I, I struggled with that. Uh, and I'm always glad to have left that part of my life behind. Okay. Uh, because in those days, it, it, it just wasn't cool. I did play some basketball. I played a little bit of football, but never uh, on the varsity team. Okay. Um, I did, uh, I took pride in my studies. Was it a large high school? Uh, there were about 100 people in my graduating class. Oh, nice size. So it was a small suburban high school. Okay. Ottawa Hills is sort of the gross point of Toledo. It's a rich person's community. Um, Do you have any brothers or sisters? Nope, I was the only child. Okay. Only right. child. And then uh, next was college. How did you happen to select Yale? I selected Yale because uh, my father thought that there was a certain polish of going to an Eastern school. And um, in those days, there was a big difference between the Ivy League and other places like Purdue and Ohio State and, and the state schools. Not so much anymore, but there, there was in those days. Uh, and I was uh, smart enough to get in and, and consider that a, a valuable life lesson going to school in a very rigorous academic environment. All right. What sort of activities or any activities? Tell us about and what we were majoring in. I wound up in, in, uh, at Yale, I wound up majoring in experimental psychology, which was cool because you could actually do research as an undergrad with a faculty without having to do many, many hard prerequisite courses with long laboratories and lots and lots of theory. You could actually get and actually do science as an undergrad. So I majored in experimental psychology, but I took electives in those hard science courses, <laughs> which my friends thought was totally crazy. But you had an interest. But I had an interest. And in fact, as, a, as an undergrad, I took Physics 25 at Yale, which was reputed to be the hardest course at Yale College, taught by Robert Berenger. Advanced General Physics, in which he actually did physics with calculus, the way God intended for man to do physics. And even though it was a very hard course, I got a B one semester and a C the next, and I studied more for that than anything else, it was a great life lesson. Right. And as I am teaching my biomedical engineering students here at Purdue this semester, some of the ideas from that course and some of the, prob the problem solving strategies that we use in physics come back. <laughs> and so my students are benefiting from that. Very good. Okay, then when did, when did you graduate? And then tell us what happened next. Weren't you going to graduate school or in medical In 68, school? I went to medical school at Baylor College of Medicine okay. in Houston, uh, having spent one year in between uh, undergrad and medical school, teaching high school in Montpelier, Ohio, at How did that come two about? on the Ohio Turnpike. That sticks in your mind so you know where the city is, right? <laughs> I get to know, know where the city is. In Montpelier High, uh, high School, I was, a, I was a chemistry teacher, I was a photography teacher, and a science teacher. And they had a national shortage of science teachers at the time. So I got a draft deferment for that. And also got a job and, and learned a little bit about teaching. Right. Now, you, you didn't take pre-med then. How did you, had you thought, given some thought to go to medical school? Oh, well, this is sort of interesting, is in my era at Yale, the pre-meds were actually looked down upon by the other students because they were considered grade grubbers. 
And so I was a closet pre-med. <laughs> I didn't want to admit it. <laughs> so I took, I took the pre-med requirements, but not in the usual sequence or the usual way, and I didn't advertise it. Because, and frankly, I wasn't sure that that's sure. what I wanted. I had some idea I wanted to do that. Um, but it, yeah, it was interesting. That's, so that's why I took that really hard physics course instead of the easy physics course. How did you happen to select Baylor? Yeah, that was so you switched from They Ohio. accepted me. This is one thing. And the reason... Did you have to didn't you have to take the exam to get into the medical school? Oh, yeah. They had well? the MCAT exam and so on. Sure. I, was ex I was accepted at Baylor and at Michigan State. I wound up picking Baylor uh, because of its amazing clinical facilities and, and hospitals down there. Uh, Michigan State turned out to be kind of like the um, IU School of Medicine regional campus we have here at Purdue right now. It was a very small program at the time. Um, and I was attracted to the big place like a lot of our students. Sure, are. I don't blame you. And, and also because J.R. Schofield, who was the dean of Baylor College of Medicine at the time, specifically wanted to recruit Ivy League grads and people from the East Coast and the West Coast and Chicagoland because he wanted Baylor to become a national medical school rather than a regional medical school. So I benefited from that, from right. my East Coast education. Sure. And I didn't know it at the time in, in, until 50 years later almost. I, I read a biography of J.R. Schofield and I realized, oh, you know, he had that idea that he wanted to expand the horizons of the school. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't have taken me. Well, you never know. Then what, uh, what was your career path then before you came to Purdue for the biomedical? And then we'll talk about the Hill and Van Biomedical Center when you came, you came with Dr. Oh, Gettys. yeah. Well, I decided. After you got your MD degree, did I you decided, do a residency? Oh, I got my, I was finishing my MD degree at Baylor. I was also in the MD master's program. And it was thinking about academic medicine. And I realized that I wanted to do academic medicine um, rather than direct patient care. I took an elective with Dr. Geddes, L.A. Geddes, who became the founder of Purdue's Biomedical Engineering Center. At that time, he was the director of the section of bioengineering in the physiology department at Baylor. I loved it. <laughs> I thought I was in heaven. And Dr. Geddes had the amazing property of welcoming anyone who was interested into his organization, regardless of age, sex, rank, religion, experience, color, or anything. He welcomed undergraduate medical students who were at the bottom of the totem pole in the hierarchy. And if they were interested, he put them to work. And I was so flattered that he would take me seriously. He gave me an office in one of the student lab um, rooms that was not being used at the time. I had a whole office. I had an L-shaped desk. I had my own little laboratory there. And he put me to work on a project that at the time I thought was really important and special. So I was up at 5 a.m. every morning and I was in there. I could see the sunrise. Uh, over the Baylor College of Medicine campus. Wow. What an experience. And I really felt like I had found my calling. So when Dr. Geddes and I, told, I went into his office very timidly asking if I might stay and do a PhD with him. At that time, there was an absolute rule in Baylor College of Medicine that nobody could have a carpeted office. Geddes had carpet in his office. <laughs> that impressed me. <laughs> and he spent lots of time with me and basically said, well, I wish that I could be your mentor for a PhD, but I've been recruited to go to Purdue to start the Biomedical Engineering Center. And I looked at him and said, You'd already finished your MD, had you gotten your I MD? I just about completely oh. finished the MD by that time. It was a combined MD master's program. Mm -hmm. So I was on track to do that. I said, all right, I'll go with you. And so I said goodbye to my girlfriend in Texas, who promptly took up with another guy. <laughs> and I followed Geddes to Purdue. 
And oh. Dr. Tacker also came at the same time? And the four of us came. And Dr. From Borland. Here. Dr. Joe Borland, Tack Tacker, myself, and Geddes were the original faculty. They called us the Baylor Mafia because we all came from Baylor. That started the original Biomedical Engineering right. Center. At Let's Purdue. talk a little bit about that. It, and how did it happen? It was the Hillenbrand Biomedical. That was the name that... Uh, yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about Bill Hillenbrand. Name. Bill Hillenbrand was a, 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 a major industrialist in Indiana from Batesville. He made his fortune, as he said, um, uh, making two things that nobody ever wants to use, caskets and hospital beds. <laughs> and he made a bundle in those. And you can still go, if you look in the interstate, you still might go past a truck that has Batesville casket written on it. And it has this hillside with two little aspen-like trees. It's the Batesville casket symbol. Well, it turns out that Batesville casket has a huge market share in the total U.S. casket market. And so uh, Hill and Brand's family were very wealthy, and they um, for they, and I think Hill and Brand was at one time, I'm not certain about this, but I think he was a board member of, of Purdue. Uh, and he wanted to start a biomedical engineering center. At Purdue? At Purdue. Okay. Be, and funded the original Biomedical Engineering Center because he had had a wonderful positive experience with Professor Paul Stanley. And Paul was he a Purdue professor? Paul Stanley was a Purdue electrical engineering professor. And in the early days, Hill and Brand had a problem with um, uh, an unfortunate death or two that happened with patients in Hill Rom beds. And this got their attention, and he, and he asked Stanley to help him. And Stanley found that there was an improper grounding of, of a motor, grounding of a motor, so that current could leak out onto the bed and cause a, and electrocute people who were made contact with the bed. So Paul Stanley said, well, that's not right. All you have to do is insulate this motor. So they took the motor, and they mounted it on a piece of wood and then mounted the wood to the frame of the bed, fixed the problem. <laughs> Nobody got electrocuted anymore. Purdue engineer to the forefront. And Bill Hillenbrand thought that Paul Stanley was a genius. And he said, we've got to make more people like this. And so he said, I will be willing to give an anonymous gift to Purdue to start a biomedical engineering center because the world needs more Paul Stanleys. And he did. And he gave $2 million, which back in those days was a lot of money. So he started, started the original Purdue Biomedical Engineering Center. Paul Stanley was the interim director himself. This is before, it had been started before you people came? Well, yes. Oh, it, okay. Yeah, the gift had been given. Paul okay. Stanley was the, was the interim director, but they had a search committee of deans that wanted to find a permanent director for the Biomedical Engineering Center. And the story that Geddes told was that um, they came to him and asked, would you be willing to do this? And, and Geddes said, well, you know, I am really very happy where I am, um, but I can think of several other people that might. And he wrote out a list and said, talk to these people right here. And he gave him the list. A year later, search committee member came back visited Dennis at Baylor and said, we've talked to all the people, we still want you. <laughs> then they made him an offer he couldn't refuse. <laughs> and part of the deal was, that Geddes said, the original deal was that they were going to pay Geddes a whole lot of money and they were going to buy him a big computer and luxury labs. And Geddes said, no, that won't work. The thing that makes for academic productivity is people, not computers. What I want is I want to be able to bring some people with me who have good ideas. Those people will write grant applications. That will bring in money, and that will make the center work. And the search committee said, well, we don't really have it budgeted quite that way, you know. <laughs> we have to turn all this capital equipment money into human money, you know. And he said, well, if you do that, I'll consider coming. Well, they did. They rebudgeted the money so it wasn't for equipment. 
And it was for people. He says, I want to bring my key staff. Well, he wanted to bring Tacker. He wanted to bring Borland. And at that time, for some reason, he saw promise in me, and he said, <laughs> I want to bring Babs, too. But they didn't have quite enough money to pay me. So I started out in my first year, for six years at Purdue, I was not only Geddes' graduate student, but I was also an instructor in biological sciences. And I taught a course for nurses and pharmacy students in human anatomy and physiology, which was biology 301, 302. Okay. Um, that course went on for six years. About halfway through, there was a really smart TA named Sandy Grabowski. And Sandy Grabowski became the lab instructor for the course after she finished her PhD with Bill Pack in biology and went on to um, teach the course after I uh, got the Research Career Development Award from the NIH, which requires that you do 80% research. You're not allowed to do a lot of teaching. So I had to give up the teaching position Sandy took over the course. She did a fabulous job. She wrote a really good textbook, which is still out there that people can buy. Um, and in middle age, came down with ovarian cancer and died several years ago, tragically. Hmm. Bless her soul. Um, but Sandy and I taught that course together for many years. And yeah. it's, I think it's still a going concern. All right. Now, then, then you moved into the Hillenbrand and tell what some of your uh, research areas and things to, when you were, were in the Hillenbrand Center then as so, the associate research scholar. Yeah, Let's so what I did, well, so as I was, I did my PhD with Geddes. Here at Purdue? At Purdue, okay. Thinking of it as a residency in research, okay? And the PhD project was on the effect of antiarrhythmic drugs on the shock strength required to defibrillate the heart. Geddes was huge uh, researcher in ventricular fibrillation and defibrillation. So when the heart goes into fibrillation, instead of beating like this, it beats like this, it just quivers, and it doesn't pump blood at all. And the only way to stop that without doing major surgery is to shock the heart. So that's what the paddles are for, you know, in the, in the TV mm -hmm. doctor show. And it works. And so Geddes was studying a whole lot of the physiology of, of defibrillation, how to do it with less energy, how to do it more effectively. And one of the things was, was, what about drugs? Do they make the threshold go up or down? And, and so that was my PhD thesis, which I did with Geddes in conjunction with um, Professor Yim in the pharmacy school, who was my co-major professor. So it was drugs and electricity sure. effects on the heart. After I finished that, um, being a young buck, I said, well, what, how can we branch out from this? And we got into CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, not just shocking the heart, but the whole business of making an artificial circulation by compressing the chest and artificial ventilation. So expanded the defib research into CPR. We had a lot of conferences, international conferences, which are still fondly remembered by some of the attendees and graduates. Starting in 1975, every two years, we had an international congress here at Purdue on defibrillation. And then after the third time, we made it defibrillation and CPR. And we did that for many, many years and attracted all of the researchers in the field to come here to Purdue where they had not 10, not 20, but 30 minute time slots to explain their research and to answer questions. And that was considered amazing at the time because people really had a chance to explain what they were doing and to get into the details and the nuts and bolts. The attendees loved it. And it became a, an important forum for um, accelerating the field of resuscitation. Sure. Okay, and then you were doing some research, and you got a couple of things. You got that bi that fellowship in biomedical engineering, the biotech one. You still have that one. Uh, v uh, was B O oh, the biotech. biotech. Yeah. Well, there were that's that was just one example of 
uh, research contracts and fellowships, we would take money any way you can get it. Okay, that's a Geddes, a Geddes rule. Take money any way you can get it. If you want, I'll tell the, um, I'll tell the mafia story. If you sure, want. please do. And that is that Geddes, when he was uh, a young man, uh, had some of his first jobs with the telephone company and learned about electronics, and this is maybe in the 1920s and 30s, you see. Grew up in Scotland, was educated some in Scotland, then came to Canada, worked in Canada, and he had a stint where he actually worked for the mafia setting up phone banks for bookmaking operations. <laughs> Very talented. <laughs> and <coughs> the deal was, <coughs> and he would set up the phone banks, and they had agreed some on a price, and, he, and the mafia guy came to him and took out a, a roll of $100 bills and said, well, let me pay you. And for some reason, Geddes was said, uh, oh, well, um, I don't really want to take cash right now. Could you write me a check? And the mafia guy looked at him and smiled, put the $100 bills back in his pocket, walked away, never saw a dime. <laughs> <laughs> After that, Geddes developed the rule, take money any way you can get it. <laughs> Oh, Cash, big... check, or money <laughs> order. Or the piggy bank as well, too. And so what we, we had a lot, and the thing about the Biomedical Engineering Center was that it was 80% self-supporting, what they call soft money in academia, grants, contracts, gifts. Only 20% of our salaries were covered by state money. For example, the part of my salary that came from teaching the physiology course, that was state money. Um, the other people, like Dr. Tacker, he taught some courses in the biology department as well, and in the veterinary school, etc. But most of the money we had to go out and hustle for. And that was... How was it in those times? It was exciting because Dr. Geddes had a wonderful way of motivating his staff. I really believed that I was doing the most important job in the world, inventing new devices and technologies to save lives, to help patients, to have an impact on the practice of medicine. We really believed that. We worked our butts off. We worked 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week. It was like doing a residency in research. Sure. But we were having fun, too, because we all were important. There, it was never, there was not a hierarchy. It's not like there's the professor up here and the assistant professor and the technician and, oh, you're a technician, you're not allowed to think. Never, ever anything like that. It was very horizontal organizational structure. We were all on the same team. Whenever Dr. Geddes had a project to start, he would go to the technicians and he would take time with them at the blackboard and he would explain the purpose of the project. He would explain the medical problem. He would explain the physiology. He'd explain the symptoms of the patient. What would happen if the patient got really sick and how this new device or this new approach would help. And he'd ask for their input and their ideas. It was a big team. A it, team was a, it was hugely team oriented. And in those days, academia didn't run like that. Mm -hmm. It was one professor in his lab, and that was a domain, and there was turf boundaries. You, you know, we never had individual labs in the Purdue, Purdue Biomedical Engineering Center. What was, were you in the Potter Center at that in time? In the Potter Building. Okay. Well, we first of all in the basement of Double E. Oh, that, I was wondering years. when you started, because Potter there, was not built at that time, was it? Right. No, we were, we were two or three years in the basement of Double E, the okay. temporary quarters, but we went in the Potter Building. Right. But under Geddes, we never had individual labs. It was all shared space. And that was just the way it was. Sure. He used to have a saying that if anybody gets a good idea, we'll drop everything, he would say, and help them do the first experiment to test out their idea. Because he knew <laughs> that once an intellectual gets a truly new idea and tries it out and it works, he's hooked. <laughs> I mean, you'll work on that thing as hard as you can for years to come because it was your idea. And so that's what drove that 80% soft funding. Sure. It, was, it was an idea factory. 
only later did I come, come across a reproduction of Thomas Edison's research notes written in Thomas Edison's own hand. And I looked and I did a genuine double take and I looked said Thomas Edison. I would have testified in a court of law that those notes were written by L.A. Geddes. It had the same print. He had the same way of drawing a graph. He had the same way of sketching the apparatus that produced the results in a little inset in the graph. It was the same handwriting. This guy is the spiritual descendant of Thomas Edison. <laughs> And no, I got to work for him, <laughs> right. which was pretty cool. Yeah. Let's talk for a few minutes on that, uh, the Lafayette Center for Medical Education. You're still affiliated with them. I've been asking people that have been involved with that. Oh, so, yes. Yeah. And you're still teaching there. Absolutely. Yeah. Taught there this morning. Peptic ulcer disease. Oh, okay. uh, one of the ways that the people at the Biomedical Engineering Center helped a little bit <laughs> to bring in money that wasn't quite as dicey as grant applications was that we would do teaching. And Dr. Tacker and I both loved medical students and loved the idea of teaching medical students. So when we found out about what is now called IU School of Medicine Lafayette, in those days it was the Lafayette Center mm -hmm. for Medical Education, and especially when we found out that they were not only going to teach first year students but second year students, which meant teaching medicine, as well as just the normal, but also teaching abnormal sure. uh, diseases and pathophysiology and anatomy. Um, we went over and talked to Lindley Wagner, who's the founding director, and said, how can we help? And he said, have I got a deal for you? you know? <laughs> and so he got us both teaching medical students, um, first in the physiology course, and then later when they put in the second year, uh, we started teaching in the Introduction to Medicine course, which was about all body systems and all different diseases. And I've been doing that for over yeah. 25 years now. In, in other words, initially it was only the first year students, and then they add, added yes. the second year. and then they first. added the second year. Right, okay. And that okay. was in, I think, 1981. Okay. So we celebrated the 25th anniversary several years ago. That's so right. it's been it's I'm, been going concern. Right, yeah. Then you moved to, now you're in the Department of Basic Medical Sciences. How does that transition? Uh, you're over there now. You've been there for some time. Yeah, well, when Dr. Geddes retired, to make a long story short, when Dr. Geddes tried to retire, <laughs> um, and there was an, 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 an inter interregnum and a power struggle and so on, um, I went over to Gordon Kopic, who was the head of um, basic medical sciences, uh, and was until just a few months ago the head of basic medical sciences. And I asked if I could um, have, the, have that department be my academic home. And he said yes, and it worked. I wound up teaching the medical students just the same. I wound up doing research almost the same. Um, and it provided better long-term uh, job security for me because in the original Biomedical Engineering Center there were, it was not allowed for the center to have tenured faculty because the exist, existing deans of the existing schools of engineering did not want another entity competing with them. So as long as we brought in our 80% soft money and paid our own way, we could do whatever we wanted. But we weren't supposed to be in competition with the existing schools of engineering. And so it was many years until Purdue, of course now has established the Weldon School right. of Biomedical right. Engineering, and now it is a real engineering school. Right. But you couldn't really be a true faculty member in biomedical engineering in those early days. Mm -hmm. Did Hillenbrand continue the support? Because you kept the name all that time. And then I guess the name was changed when Weldon for the school was that. Right. Hillenbrand, Hillenbrand, to my knowledge, did not give any additional gifts other than the initial founding bolus. But we did have research contracts with Hillenbrand Industries. And also you had Hillrom, which is 
Part Hill of Rum, yes. Right. And Hill right. Rum, in fact, I was the principal investigator on one research grant, which was kind of cool, and that is that they, they were in the hospital bed business, right? And they wanted to develop a system to study pressure sores, bed sores. That patients, are, that patients get in their tend to be paralyzed or very sick and can't move very much right. and just the pressure of the weight of, of the person on the mattress if they don't move around you know <laughs> what happens is is it's it's puts enough weight to choke off capillary blood flow to the skin and if they do that for a long enough period the skin will break down and cause ulcers well Hillram wanted to develop a bed that would minimize bed sores and ulcers, pressure sores. And in order to do this, they had to know where the high pressure spots were. So what we did is propose an idea that we would make a bed that had a nice uniform layer of foam rubber. And we took electrically conducting nylon fabric, which had little silver wires, silver coated nylon, woven into it. And we made a matrix of strips of silver coated nylon that went this way on the bottom, sorry, this way on the bottom, and this way on the top. And every intersection was a capacitor. And we figured out a way of measuring the capacitance at every single one of those intersections. So we found so we could make 1,536 different pressure sensors on a mattress. And in those days, the computer technology to make the image was considered advanced. Now it would be considered trivial. <laughs> All right. And so we, we had a system that had a video screen on it, and it showed exactly the pressure of a person lying on a bed. And you could see the hips and the arms and so on, and you knew how much pressure there was. And that became a key research tool for Hillram to design their surfaces to, make, to eliminate the high pressure spots or the hot spots. And they did, and succeeded in bringing out some products in that, and they were very happy. Good. Well, that sounds very. That good. was almost that. That was a hundred thousand dollar plus contract. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And then we got some awards and honors. I think that uh, outstanding professor of basic medical science from the IU Medicine. You got some other awards, but that's a nice. Those are nice. The teaching awards. T yeah, it, it was easier in those days <laughs> because the tradition of American medical schools. The standard of instruction was the boring lecture. <laughs> and the standard of instruction was to find someone who was very knowledgeable about a particular subspecialty of medicine who would make these, in those days, two by two slides. They were projected with an actual photo projector as opposed to a computer. And they would have bullet point after bullet point. This is how Bill Gates got the idea for the default modes in PowerPoint, which are terrible. Because after the first 24 bullets, you go to sleep. Well, that's what it was like. And, and that was how medicine was taught. So when Tacker and I came over to the Lafayette Center for Medical Education, being more enthusiastic and engaging types of teachers who really liked students and who thought it was cool and, and could put on a little bit of a show, the students just loved it because they didn't go to sleep. <laughs> right. Nowadays it's harder to win teaching awards because teachers are more attuned and a lot more um, modern techniques of education have gradually gotten into medical schools. Right. Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. And you got the Outstanding Alumnus Award from the Biomedical Engineering Center. Yeah, I'm okay. kind of proud of that, too. That's very nice. Because, the, because were the, you surprised when you got it? Uh, a little bit, yeah, because I was so young. <laughs> that makes it even better. <laughs> and how about the coach of the year for the soccer? Tell us. Oh, Lordy. Well. And then family. You have some family. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, I have three kids, uh, a son who's now graduated from Notre Dame Law School and is starting in, in his law career and twin daughters who graduated from college. And Did they come to Purdue? 
and they didn't go to Purdue. Uh, my son went to Yale. Uh, I've been accused of being an elitist. My son went to Yale. Uh, my one daughter was as a Vanderbilt yeah, grad. Yeah, twins. And, I, and, and her twin sister graduated from DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana. Um, so we went with the, went the private school route. As, we were gr as they were growing up, um, my son first got interested in soccer, and so I started out as an assistant coach. And since you had to drive them, you know, to the practice site, and <laughs> it was only a short practice in the early days and had to drive back, well, why not stay? Well, if you're going to stay, then help out. So I started helping out. And then from there it snowballed on to being a recreational head coach, and then I got into the travel soccer, and then I got into high school soccer. My daughters would not let me coach the same team they were on. So when they were in high school varsity, I said, all right, would it be okay if I coached the JV? Well, I needed a JV coach. So I coached JV for five years, um, had some great teams, and then I did coach varsity at West Lafayette High School for one year. We had a team that went the farthest in the state tournament in the history of the school, took a 500 level team and took them to number eight, number eight in the state. We played the number one, the current and future state championship team to single overtime double overtime, and penalty kicks in the semi-state, lost in penalty kicks by literally that much, that team went on to win the Final Four easily. Very and good. their fans were tell, told us, you're the hardest team we played all year. <laughs> it's good to hear. So that was my coaching career yeah. in a nutshell. No, you know, it was really a lot of fun. And you kept pretty active in your professional associations as well over the years. Have you ever had any offices, any of them, or? Um, like the, you're, the Council on Circulation of the American Heart Association. Well, when. that yeah, what I wound up doing because of the CPR research, um, what I wound up doing was uh, actually the start. Our family went on vacation in Tucson, Arizona, and I had dinner with an old friend who come to do research on CPR at Purdue for many weeks in a row named Carl Kern. And Carl Kern was actively involved in the American Heart Association committees that write the guidelines for CPR, which were national guidelines and are now becoming international guidelines. And he asked, would you like to be on this committee? And I kind of said, gulp, okay. So I spent about six years working on the National Heart Association guideline writing committees. Um, for uh, advanced cardiac life support. Um, so that, and, and after do all that work, I got one paragraph in the guideline. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't play it by the numbers or whatever. And you've been doing some consulting, huh? Yes. Quite a bit. And does that continue on? You got uh, Pfizer and, well, Hill Rom too, and Johnson and Johnson. Oh, yeah, those were in the early days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've continued. One of the good things about the Geddes operation was that he encouraged people to, first of all, look at companies as allies in medical device development, not as enemies. <laughs> and it, you can spend years developing a new idea or a new device. And if the only thing that happens is that you publish a paper about it, it stays on the library shelf and nobody reads it, you haven't really impacted medical mm -hmm. care. So especially in biomedical engineering, it's important to work collaboratively with device companies and... And, and, and collaborate. Yeah, so that they're gonna, somebody has to make the product if it's gonna help people. If they've gotta make it and sell it to hospitals so when you walk into a hospital you actually see the device being used. And, and I had the pleasure of getting my blood pressure taken by a Dynamap device in the operating room when I had my knee surgery that we had worked on in the Biomedical Engineering Center. And, you know, the, and, and it's nice to know that you've had an impact. So we never thought that, that working with companies was beneath the dignity of, a, of an academic, you know. I mean, now, of course, nowadays, it's technology transfer. That's the big deal. Right. But in the early days, there were many professors at Purdue who said, oh, it, that, that, that that's um, uh, 
low-class applied research. We only do pure research. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to return to a question. When the Hillenbrand Center started, were there similar schools or departments elsewhere in the country? Or was this, or that was the first one in the state of Indiana, the Hillenbrand Biomedical Center? I believe, yes, okay. definitely in the state of Indiana. If there were not, were there others probably in other places in the country too? There were other biomedical engineering programs at places like Duke and University of Wisconsin and University of Utah. Okay. Uh, but I believe, honestly, that the Purdue one was clearly one of the top five in the country. And it was, maybe, were some of those others, would they have been affiliated with a medical school or not, or they could have been affiliated with the university itself? It, it's interesting in that, yes, all the others were affiliated with medical schools. Okay. Um, Purdue was the only one that didn't have a medical school officially right here on campus. Right. But, of course, we did have the regional campus of Indiana University Medical School where we taught. Um, but that was very little known. It hasn't, it hasn't been um, discovered until just a couple years ago. And now more and more people know about it. Right. But in those days, it was in the, you know, it's the basement of Lynn Hall. It was literally a subterranean operation <laughs> under the radar. <laughs> uh, let's talk about any guy, uh, favorite Purdue tradition and outstanding event. Oh, well, I don't, and I'm trying to think of a favorite Purdue tradition. With, when we were married, before, did you meet your wife here? But, yes, I did. Oh, okay. And before we were married, we had season basketball tickets, greatly coveted, you know, and we would go to all the men's basketball games. Um, then we got into kids. <laughs> And they kind of required babysitting at home, and we reluctantly gave up our season basketball tickets. And, and now I wish seats. we hadn't. <laughs> so now what I do, you we were talking about Dr. Tacker, is that, that we share season tickets. And we've never been able to get back our original seats. I wish I'd had my good seats. What's your name in for the Mackey expansion? Maybe you'll luck out. <laughs> <laughs> and then do you have a, uh, how about an outstanding event? Anything like that? Anything that you'd like to share with us? You know, I've thought about that as I was walking over here, and one of the outstanding events in my life is walking into a class of either my medical students or biomedical engineering students and literally seeing their bright, young, eager faces. Very good. It is a joy, yes. and it gives me faith in the future. All right. Now, the ball is in your court. Any closing comments or some things, topics that you want to make any further comments on overall? I would be happy to come back sometime and talk even more about the Biomedical Engineering Center okay. under Dr. Geddes. I think that it was a truly remarkable intellectual environment which deserves to be remembered and replicated. It was very much like, I think, you know, you're talking about history here, an interest That's in history. That's right, yeah. It was very much like what I gather from light reading. The original Thomas Edison Research Facility at Menlo Park. And I think in more ways than one, this was part of Thomas Edison's spiritual legacy that just happened to have cropped up here at Purdue. And Purdue ought to make a big deal about that. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, the, the type of team spirit, people living there. I mean, we had people sleeping there. We had people doing 24 hours experiments there. We had people bringing in their food and their sleeping bags. It was a family of people dedicated to a mission of, of improving health care and of using, as Dr. Geddes said, all the tools of engineering to make a positive impact on the practice of medicine. And the kind of teamwork that we had, the kind of collaborative spirit, the kind of creative juices that were kept bubbling up all the time. It was really special. Good. Uh, I felt like 
sometimes we were like the Israeli cabinet surrounded by hostile Arabs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, really charging. And it, was, um, it was us against the world, you know, but there was no friction internally. There was no academic infighting. And there was all kinds of trust. And that maximized the productivity of the organization. Somehow, that special creative atmosphere gradually died out. <laughs> and, and it would be a wonderful thing to focus on it from a historical perspective and, and try to resurrect it because it, w it was like, see, Thomas Edison's Menlo Park was the original research institute. It was the original mm -hmm. think tank. And there was an awful lot of that spirit that I think came to Geddes. The difference is, is though, that Geddes's, I mean, Edison's outfit, 100% men, no women. Mrs. Edison would come and bring them food for their all-night experiments, <laughs> but that was her role. That was a key role. That was a key role. But from the very beginning, an interesting thing about the Biomedical Engineering Center was our key faculty all of the key faculty were married to women who had PhDs or MDs. <laughs> and we brought in people like Sandy Ralston, who was an RN PhD. And so from the beginning, although it is, in engineering it was still male dominated in that time, but we still had a, a lot of respect for females. And we brought in talented women whenever we could find them as well as talented high school students, talented surgeons, talented undergrads. We had a history major. Geddes had a history major. I had a sports psychology major with my soccer team who published a paper on the sports psychology of soccer before it was cool, and he actually got an offer from the Indonesian national team to be their sports psychologist. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so. It was right. this amazing creative atmosphere, and I think it would be wonderful to topic to explore, um, especially while Get Dr. Geddes is still living, um, because to the extent that universities and companies could reproduce that and make it like Thomas Edison's original Menlo Park, you know, it will be a great boon to innovation. And it doesn't just have to be biomedical. It could be any field sure. that you want. I mean, right. Edison did all kinds of things that were Transparency, that's right. Right. Yeah. Right. And it would be a really cool thing for a historian okay. to explore. Okay. We will think about it. Thank you, Dr. Babs. I appreciate this. We well, are very, very welcome and very kind. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we'll pursue that, though. Uh, thank you, Brian.